Hey guys, June here, and this is going to be kind of a weird video. We're talking about the psychology behind e-dating, but as I was contemplating how I was going to format this video and doing a little bit of research, I actually realized that there's so many different ways that I could approach this topic, I actually want to split it into multiple different videos so that I can cover each of these subtopics in the appropriate amount of depth. Before we get started though, I have a couple of important disclaimers to make. First up, there will be some brief and basic discussion of the biological functions of sex from a perfectly academic standpoint with no gory details. We are talking about relationships, and sexuality and reproduction are a huge driving force behind how relationships work, but if for some reason you find the basic discussion of this to be completely in poor taste, then I recommend not watching this video. The second disclaimer is something I feel like I didn't emphasize strongly enough in the last video, which is the amount of oversimplification involved to meaningfully talk about human psychology. Human relationships aren't a simple engineering problem with a clear and well-defined answer. Even as individuals, our psychology is a really emergent property from a complex system of thousands of interacting effects and processes in our brain. Take two of these complex chaotic systems and put them together and try and assess the way that they interact, and the only meaningful way that you can actually describe that interaction is from really, really strongly oversimplifying it and talking about things from very narrow perspectives at any one time. Because of that, we have to remember that any statements that are made in the fields of psychology are usually about trends and averages rather than blanket statements that are expected to be generalized to all circumstances. Just as an example, the last video didn't include any discussion of narcissistic personality disorder, and a couple of people pointed out in the comments that that effect may also have been a motivating factor in the behaviors that I was talking about, which is 100% correct. However, if I were to try to break down all of the different potential motivating factors, I would be spending my entire life here making videos, and you would be spending your entire life watching that video just to talk about one single behavior. The last disclaimer stems pretty naturally from that second one, but because we're talking about e-dating and I specifically want to address how it manifests in RuneScape, I'm only going to be talking about heterosexual relationships. If I were to get sidetracked with things like transgenderism, polyamory, or homosexuality, this video could very quickly become several hours long, and I think overall that would detract from the focus on RuneScape itself, but I also don't want the comments to devolve into some kind of crazy comment war after somebody goes full SJW. So just keep in mind that that absence from our discussion is a result of the oversimplification and not from prejudice. So with that out of the way, the topic of our first video is actually going to be at looking at the outfits that e-daters tend to wear and what sort of implicit communication might be there. It's often difficult to pin down exactly what an e-date outfit is, but they're certainly generalized enough that you would know one when you see one and I think we can make some meaningful assessments based on that. The idea we're getting at here is that very much like corollaries in the animal kingdom such as the peacock, the appearance of an e-dater might be trying to communicate some sort of a message to potential e-dating partners as part of their courtship. Deciphering what some of those implicit messages might be brings us into one of the most controversial subjects in human psychology, which is evolutionary psychology. The premise of this field of study is that natural selection in very much the same way as it selects for biological fitness kind of breeds into us certain behaviors and subconscious desires. The reason this field is controversial is that things are mostly hypothetical here in the sense that you can't experimentally verify them. Rather, the focus is on establishing one or more plausible explanations for the behaviors that we see. Just to give an example, if you were to ask a male why he likes females with large breasts, his answer is likely to be, I don't know, I just like large breasts for some reason. From the perspective of evolutionary psychology, one such explanation might be that the large breasts communicate to the male subconsciously that the female is able to produce more milk, thus ensuring the success of the offspring and, in the end, a better chance for the success of his genetic lineage, making her a more desirable mate. This would, in effect, create a selective pressure that caused men who valued large breasts in a potential mate to have a slightly higher than average success rate with their offspring, ensuring that whatever genes contributed to causing that person to value larger breasts in the first place were passed on and became more prolific within the community. So from there, let's take a look at some of the basics of human reproduction and see if we can extract any kind of a general statement about these subconscious motivations. A human female has on average one ovulation cycle per month, and assuming successful reproduction is also responsible for gestating that fetus for an additional nine months. Accounting for this, the potential output of offspring for a human female, disregarding the existence of things like twins and triplets which represent a very small minority of pregnancies, is about one child per year. By contrast, a human male produces an average of about 1500 sperm per second, and unlike the female, he has no obligate biological responsibility after impregnation. Because of these strong restrictions on the frequency of the ability of the female to reproduce, and the essential freedom of the male to reproduce as frequently as he likes, assuming he can find potential mates, we call the female of the human species the sexually selective gender. This difference is the main driving force behind the motivations that I want to talk about in this video, but we can also see reverberations of this in our culture. The fact that we tend to view promiscuity as a negative trait in females, whereas we don't have such a negative connotation for that in males, seems to be an emergent property of this biological disparity. 
So if we were to take these traits and try and deduce a statement of motivation from the perspective of natural selection, keeping in mind that that's just a limitation of language and natural selection doesn't necessarily have intention, we can break the female perspective down into two statements. The first is that she wants to ensure that her partner represents the appropriate level of genetic fitness and offers her offspring the best contribution to their 50% of the genetics that they'll get from the father towards being well suited to their environment. This is of course very vague and is also held true for essentially every organism that has ever existed, but from the human perspective this represents things like healthy height weight proportions, bilateral symmetry, and other basic indicators of general health. This would be the explanation from the perspective of evolutionary psychology that we find people who are physically fit in general more attractive than people who are obese or other such examples. The other and more interesting statement we can derive here is that she's looking to ensure that her partner is both capable of and intends to provide for the needs of the offspring, such as protection from predators or other males, providing food, and other such things. The reasoning behind this is that all of the biological limitations on the frequency of her ability to reproduce put much more value in the success of single offspring. Because she's capable of producing so few offspring, the loss of one represents a much larger blow to her overall genetic lineage than would be so for the male. This leads us to his perspective, and the first of his motivations is the same as the female. He wants to make sure that she represents genetic fitness in the sense that he doesn't want all of his offspring to have chromosomal disorders or anything like that. But his second motivation is to ensure the fidelity of his partner. He's individually far less concerned with the success of specific offspring since, given access to enough females, he could potentially produce an unlimited number of them. However, he's desperate to ensure the fidelity of his partner because not only is he losing out on a little bit of his ability to reproduce, assuming a female is mating with a rival male, but her offspring then represents competition for resources that decreases the potential success of his offspring, compromising his genetic lineage in the future. Now, I'm sure by now most of you are thinking, what the hell am I listening to? What's going on? This was a RuneScape video, and I know, but we're going to take these motivations with us into the next segment of the video and see how they may have been repurposed into the communications going on in e-dating outfits. So here are a few male outfits that people were describing as typical of e-daters. Let's see if we can identify anything that may, in an abstract sense, be satisfying one of those two motivations. The first thing that jumps out at me here is that all three of these guys have made selections for the body and leg armor that don't massively alter the shape of the character model. Because we are talking about a video game, the basic character model is in a very real sense modeled after what most people would consider to be the ideal body type. Sticking as closely as possible to this basic character model seems to be a way of satisfying the first of the two motivations as closely as possible within the limitations of working with a video game. The second thing that I think is most iconic with e outfits, especially in males, is an emphasis on symbolizations of wealth, such as diet equipment or party hats. Now, it's obviously no secret that wealth is almost universally considered to be an attractive trait, but I want to draw special attention to the fact that there seems to be some directionality with it, especially in this case, where wealth is a particularly attractive trait in a male and not quite so important as a trait in a female. My speculation here is that this has to do with an abstract way of satisfying the second of the two motivations that we talked about for the females, which was providing for the needs of the offspring. Now, obviously, a female looking at these people isn't saying to themselves, oh, I'm going to make internet babies with this person, and his party hat indicates to me that he has the wealth to provide for their financial needs. Very much like the example I gave earlier regarding breasts, I think that the person subjectively just sees wealth as attractive and doesn't necessarily know why they find it attractive. In fact, I want to draw a pretty strong corollary here with some behaviors in the animal kingdom. This is a bowerbird. These are a family of birds that are native to Australia and New Guinea, and they have a pretty similar behavior amongst their mating habits. As part of attracting a female, they create a small structure, usually out of twigs or straw, but they also collect random items from around and organize them by color into piles. These items can be anything from berries or flowers all the way through pieces of plastic and other types of litter that have been left by humans, and it doesn't seem to serve any purpose other than to potentially communicate to the female that the male is able to forage and meet whatever potential foraging needs she or her offspring may have. In that respect, it seems like natural selection has bred into the female bowerbirds the sense that this behavior is attractive regardless of the fact that the items after having been collected actually serve no purpose for improving the life of the female. To try and stretch this abstract sense of satisfying the second motivation a little bit further, there also seems to be an emphasis on things that imply a skill in PVM, such as the Mall of Omens override here, or things that imply commitment for long durations of time, such as the Trimmed Completionist Cape or 120 Capes. This may relate to communicating to the female that the individual is capable of maybe meeting task-related needs, such as if the female perhaps wants to get the completionist cape herself but isn't capable of doing Yakamaru for lack of skill, the male can assist in that in the same sense that maybe in the wild a male would protect the female from predators. 
In a similar sense, the capes may in a nebulous way communicate to the female that regardless of the length or difficulty of any task required to meet her needs, they're willing to follow through with it. I will grant that this one is a bit more of a stretch of the imagination than the last explanation, but I also have a relatively good corollary for this in the animal kingdom. This is a Japanese pufferfish, and these guys have some of the coolest mating behavior. As part of their courtship, the male will spend hours or days crafting a complex geometric pattern on the ocean floor that can span up to several meters across. If the courtship is successful, the individuals indeed mate in the center of the circle, but what's really interesting about this is there doesn't appear to be any kind of success advantage in terms of doing this, rather than just mating at some barren part of the ocean floor. In that respect, it seems like the individual may just be trying to communicate to the female that he is dedicated to doing whatever necessary for her and the offspring. The last thing to cover before I close out on the male outfits is actually something that we'll also see in the female outfits, and that is capitalizing on popular fashion in its current sense with the inclusion of things like scarves, sunglasses, or basic glasses. Like all types of fashion, this seems to be an effort to associate the self or the identity of the individual with a group or a community and whatever attributes that community might have. In that sense, these don't appear to be intending to communicate any sort of an implicit message as far as the other items that we discussed. If, however, you think you have a compelling reason from the perspective of natural selection why these items might be communicating something, I would be interested in hearing what your thoughts are in the comments. So now let's move on to some of the female outfits and see if we can pick out some trends from here as well. First up, just like we saw with the males, we can see a clear emphasis on things that don't add excess bulk to the basic character model to try and capitalize on satisfying that first of the evolutionary motivations. And just like in the case with the males, we see them capitalizing on some elements of fashion like the sunglasses as well. As we would expect to see from my hypothesis earlier regarding the wealth attractiveness being directional from male to female, we don't see much implying wealth on these characters. However, we see the emergence of a few new types of items that may be trying to abstractly satisfy that second of the male evolutionary motivations. Fidelity is often equated with innocence, and the halo, as we see on the left, is definitely a cultural symbol of innocence in the extreme sense. The teddy bear offhand, or the vampire plushie offhand, which is another alternative I see relatively commonly in female e-dating outfits, seem to imply youth. As disgusting as the idea may be, female youth is often associated with the idea of sexual ignorance, and the intent seems to be that if a male can ensure that he's the first partner that a female has, he's more capable of ensuring her fidelity long term. In this dark sense, the teddy bear offhand and the implication of youth alongside that seems to be a way of communicating both innocence and fidelity to potential partners as well. Just to emphasize once again, I'm not trying to imply that all male e-daters are child predators or anything like that. These don't represent conscious desires. Our idea is simply that we see these things as attractive in a female and don't necessarily understand the reasons for them. And furthermore, like I said earlier in the video, these are all hypothetical assessments of what might possibly be the explanations for things that we find attractive in females with relatively no conscious reason. If you have an alternative explanation for what might be appealing about the idea of a teddy bear or plushie offhand, I'm also curious to hear that in the comments as well. Finally, I want to take a quick look at one last type of e-dater that does not fit well into either of the previous categories. This last category seems to capitalize as much as possible on attention-grabbing aspects, like in this case, the half-naked female with a beard look. Other individuals from this category might be the people who pick the items that have a particle-like effect in every particular slot so they're a walking GPU crash. I deliberated on this for a while, but the only thing that I can think of associating all these individuals together is the old saying that any publicity is good publicity. This ability to distract attention from competing e-daters may be even more effective than trying to satisfy those subconscious desires we talked about earlier and make them a relatively successful species of e-dater. Just to draw a quick tongue-in-cheek comparison to a corollary in the animal kingdom for these guys, this is a stock-eyed fly. They have a suitably abnormal mating behavior in the sense that this is what a young stock-eyed fly looks like. However, while they're still young and their exoskeletal structure isn't completely solid yet, they spend a length of time quite literally inflating their own head, causing their eyeballs to bulge out onto long stalks, giving them their namesake. Female stock-eyed flies tend to sexually select for males with longer eye stalks for no obvious evolutionary reason. I personally don't think this associates very well with the competition for attention behavior that I was talking about with the e-dates, but it is a good excuse to bring up a pretty interesting insect. So in closing, I think you will definitely agree this was a really, really weird video, but it turns out that even a question as simple as why do e-daters dress like they do often have a really complex and interesting answer. 
Hopefully you found this video interesting, even though we deviated pretty heavily from RuneScape there at the beginning to get ourselves set up with those motivations. When we revisit e-dating in the next video, we're going to be looking more at the emotional interactions between the individuals and how that landscape is affected by the fact that the relationship is occurring over the internet and the inherent anonymity thereof. However, I also get that this video was a bit on the ridiculous side, and so if this was just not what you were looking for, you can also just downvote this video, and if a sufficient amount of you don't want to see this kind of thing continue, I will definitely get that message. Either way, I hope you guys learned something, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.